Okay, thank you everybody for coming to our next webinar. The, uh, this is number 60 in our webinar series. This is one that we've been uh, been excited about talking about and uh, we're having uh, uh, John Block is back to visit us again. This is his second uh, time he's joined us as a co-host and I'm, uh, I'm really pretty excited about that. The, uh, the topic is one that when we, uh, when we mentioned it uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I did get a number of notes about it saying, boy, I am really looking forward to this. This is, a, this is something that's been a little bit of a, uh, to, to capture the title, a, a little bit of a mystery. And uh, the, uh, but certainly a confusion for a number of folks exactly how this works. And, and, uh, and maybe at the end of this, we'll have some suggestions and, uh, and some ideas of how to either calculate your own or, or some suggested starting spots. So we will, uh, we will do that, kind of looking forward to that. Um, John, if you'd go ahead and get to the next slide, that would be great. The uh, let, let's uh, let's do a quick introduction on John. Uh, he, he, I've um, I've known John for a little bit, and uh, his background has always been uh, uh, intriguing to me, and I, I've enjoyed uh, getting to know him a little bit more as part of these webinars and some of his background and some of the stuff that he does, and and even some of the stuff you even do currently with the machine shop stuff I, is is always an interest to me as well, John. So, give us a little bit about uh, a little bit about your background, how you ended up. Uh, here at this point in, uh, in in the great year of 2020? Oh, it probably goes back to that joke, uh, old enough to know better, but uh, doing it anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, not counting go-karts. Um, you know, I bought my first full-size race car in 1970. So you can do the math. Yeah, it's like 50 years. So... <laughs> Um, like most everybody, you know, I started racing locally and trying to climb the ladder and somehow in 85, I found myself as the uh, team engineer for the Gallus IndyCar team. And as luck would have it that year, we got the pole at Indy 500. Well, that just kind of opened the floodgates and then I kind of got to write my own ticket after that. Um, so you know, I've been involved with uh, Indy Cars, Indy Lights, uh, the whole Road to Indy program, uh, all kinds of, you know, late models, sprint cars, modifieds, working up to ARCA, trucks, NASCAR Cup. So I've been very fortunate to have lived the dream, but you know what they say, you know, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. <laughs> so, the, the dreams can, can sometimes turn into the nightmare, right? These, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that picture in the upper left-hand corner, that is a very, very young John Block, isn't it? Yeah, that would have been uh, about 1971. That, that was my second car. Is that a is so, that dirt track or is that, uh, is that yeah, paved oval? Nope, that was dirt track modifieds. Nice. Um, that thing should have killed me three or four times. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that I was so weight conscious that I was dangerous, but I was so weight conscious. You were weight conscious the dangerous. point of being dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even to the point where, um, you know, it was all about left side weight, left side weight. And I just you know, kind of figured out, hey, if I take my door bars and cut them in half and slide the seat up against it, nobody will know that they're only half bars and I can get more left oh, side weight. So my goodness, yeah, there was, that's just one <laughs> of the stupid things I did. I'm, I'm very lucky to still be here. I, I could have just as easily been a, yeah, you know, a statistic, huh? A statistic. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's circle track. It's a left side. No, nobody's. You're never going to get hit or hit anything with the right side at the left side, right? So, uh, uh, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, that's a horrible plan, John. <laughs> yeah, we um, we live and learn, right? So. Yep. So as I got older, um, I'd say probably my biggest fault is I'm too cautious. Uh, the folks I work with now are probably saying. Why didn't you make that change two times ago? And it's like, well, I'm trying not to kill you. <laughs> so, but um, you know, on a serious note, um, I have personally been standing right on the edge of track and see somebody die. I had one of my early mentors got killed in a sprint car. So it does change your perspective. So everybody, please be careful. You know, racing will kill you if you give it even the tiniest little chance. So be careful. 
it's odd that's... how we can all love something that is uh, that can uh, that can be so hazardous at times. It's kind of yes. a crazy, crazy uh, yes. thing. Yes, it will change your perspective. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Let's uh, let's start off with a quick poll, and then we'll jump into the sampling rate uh, side of this uh, uh, deeply. So I'm gonna I'm gonna launch a poll as we get started. Uh, it's one that we use uh, here quite a bit. It it really does help us understand where where we are at. Um, give us an idea of what uh, Aim Sports hardware do you own and use, and uh, if it's other, and, and maybe the other is a different brand. The uh, uh, you've got the uh, other down there below for Smarty Cams or other, and then put the put the other into the uh, into the into the chat box helps me find it later as I kind of compile these things and, and continue to make some notes. So the um, uh, the uh, the other picture that I, I like here a lot is the the, the Talladega one it, right in the middle. You know, it's uh, to me that um, you know there when you when you're engineering a car or you're a data guy, there has to be some really small little changes that are uh, that that are uh, or they're making a stock car go at those speeds. So I, I always enjoy that one as well. And who's that? Uh, who's that fellow right in the middle that's uh, got his thumb up there? That's uh, uh, that's saying? Kirk Kirk Shemadine. Absolutely. Uh, he was our driver at that point. Went on um, to be a huge crew chief for uh, the likes of Dale Earnhardt as well. Right? Yeah, he got uh, he was never really kind of credited for what he should have been because I think he got four of Dale's championships, and everybody always looks at Larry, and exactly. Larry only got three. And I was like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was never one that was out there in front uh, all the time, right? But he was, uh, he was, he, I, I didn't, ne I've never met him, but uh, I always, uh, I look back and uh, and read about him, part of uh, Alan Kowicki's deal too, as well, if I remember right. And uh, so uh, a lot of background and a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, a lot of wins from him, a lot of speed. Yeah, he was one of my favorite drivers that I've worked with, but also a challenge because, you know, he was supposed to be driving, and every time I looked over my shoulder, he was over there, you know, changing something. I'd have to run back and change it back to where I wanted it. And then it's like, yeah. The yeah. crew chief was never far from his mind, even when he was a driver. Huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> and and calling from, um, oh, what, uh, happened to be at that time at Talladega, we were in the lead, and he calls in, I'm coming in, four tires. And I look at our crew chief, and we're shaking our heads. No, you don't need four tires. We're going to do a two tire so you can get the hell back out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he was screaming so loud that when we went back and watched the uh, video, you could hear it on the camera. I was like, whoops. <laughs> oh, well. That's yeah. racing. Fun. Competitive guy on top of it all, right? Yep. <laughs> Let's go ahead and end that poll, and uh, and I appreciate everybody everybody doing that. Uh, we don't share this one too much. A lot of a uh, lot of information there, but other was the largest topic, by the way. So, uh, perfect, uh, uh, John. If you want to slide up to the next slide, the uh, and we will go ahead and and um, and begin our process of of chatting about sampling rates. It's it's a topic that that again, as I mentioned just a little bit earlier, there has been a, a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about even before this. And then once we announced that we were gonna do it, it was like, yeah, let's let's chat about that. That's something I've uh, I've been really wondering about how to how to do that. We all got a kind of an idea of what we do, but it'll it'll be fun to see that some of the science behind it. So, let's turn this over to you, John. And uh, and we're doing this one for for those following along. We're doing this one a little bit different. The uh, presentation is on John's end, so there will maybe a little bit of a delay in some of the some of the, the slide uh, changes, but it's uh, it will not be bad at all. So we'll have a good time. Okay, hit it, John. Okay, um, welcome everybody. Let's uh, talk about something we hardly ever talk about. <laughs> All right, today's session is not intended to be a training for young aspiring electrical engineers. Um, rather, we're just going to cover some fundamentals. So when you look at your data, all those squiggly lines will make a better picture. So let's start with three fundamentals of data. First, Data, you know, when we record data, it's not like a river, just continuously flowing by us, you know, with an infinite number of uh, points along the way. Data is uh, stored more like a movie, you know, individual frames strung together to create an image. For example, here on Zoom, you know, you can all see me here on the little picture. Well, you're not really seeing a, uh, you know, continuous uh, representation. It's actually 30 frames per second, but it's smooth and flows like a river. But just remember, it's actually individual frames. Well, if we took 
this movie and we turned it sideways, you know, we would realize that it is a collection of individual pictures, right? Think of those individual pictures as the basis for sampling rate in your data system. All right, the next fundamental is how data gets recorded. You know, the, the system is set up so that it uh, is ready to go and it says, okay, sensor, what voltage do you have? And it records it in the logger, all right? It waits a little bit and it says, hey, what voltage do you have? And it records it in the logger, all right? How often this happens is what's known as sampling rate or sample rate, all right? The last little fundamental we'll talk about here is the word Hertz. No, not the rental company, <laughs> but it's named after Heinrich Hertz and is often shortened to just HZ. So anytime you see HZ, you know, it's referring to Hertz. All right, now Hertz is a term we use with sampling rate. And basically it's just a, a way of quantifying something, how to measure something. And it's based on seconds. So if I say one Hertz, it means that something is sampled one time per second. And if we say a hundred Hertz, well, it means a hundred times per second. All right, so we're gonna use that term here in our data to quantify how many times something gets recorded in the logger. All right, enough of that fundamental stuff. Let's get into the, the actual hardware and software. All right, with your AIM system, you can easily change those sampling rates. And when you go to Race Studio 3 and you open it up, now it may not open up to this uh, particular slide. If you had had a previous button punch before, it will bring up that. So just go to the little wrench, let me change the little gear button here. You can tell I've been doing this for a lot of years. It used to be a wrench button. <laughs> now it's something else. Um, but here you can see, um, you know, I've got a, a MXL2 shown here and I can edit this. So if I select it and then come over to the right side, you may need to hit the little gear button over here. But if I were to select or click here on open this configuration for editing, it will bring up all of my channels listed under the channels tab. And here you can see all the channels on your system. And over here on the right column where it says frequency, these are your sampling rates. So you see 20 Hertz, one Hertz, 50 Hertz, and so on. So that's where this is located. Now, if I wanted to change one of these, I could select one Let's say I selected the left front suspension potentiometers here, and I can get a pop-up window here with my channel settings. And if I then go to the sampling frequency button, I can use the uh, little arrows here. Then you see all the sampling rates that I can select for this channel. All right, well, that's plenty easy. Um, but the question is, what should these numbers be? <laughs> you know, there are lots of recommendations and they may appear to be you know, pretty scattered across the board. So today I will explain why I recommend certain ranges of uh, sampling rates. Now, before I get into those little details, just to be 100% accurate scientifically, I need to say that all systems have some minor inaccuracies. Even if they're properly calibrated and now your you know, channels are zero or whatever, but it has to do with the fact that we are taking an analog uh, occurrence and we're capturing it in a digital world. So that analog to digital conversion of a zero to five volt uh, signal on a 12 volt system and throw in some repeatability, you know, for the things that uh, electrical engineers like to take, take care of. But just know that those inaccuracies are really, really small and really don't tend to impact us racers. However, 
if we were trying to hit the moon, you know, 239,000 miles away, maybe those little inaccuracies uh, would add up to something big. But for us here, you know, we can typically just kind of ignore those things. All right, now right, that's all. Robbie just shared in, in the in the chat box, and we'll, we'll have it down in the description box below, uh, um, a, a document that we've put together with just some people, some fo different folks um, uh, suggested sampling rates. Uh, but John's going to give us a much in, more in-depth view of, of how to, to, to fine tune those for your personal use, but the, you know, a lot of people like to have just a starting spot. So uh, go ahead and download that or get uh, click on the link down in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube later. Okay, cool. Thanks, Robbie. Um, so, you know, we're not going to worry about trying to hit the moon. You know, meanwhile, back here on Earth, um, let's racers. Let's let's look at some uh, some mechanical stuff. All right, racing machines have lots of rotating parts. You know, crankshafts, wheels, and uh, you know, one physical output from a rotating part is a wavy pattern, um, a lot of times called a, you know, a wave pattern. Um, and I want, wanted to make sure I gave uh, you know, stack exchange physics uh, credit for this, you know, just we're using this as educational purposes. But this is really good for uh, demonstrating how a rotating object, you know, let's say a wheel, um, will create this wavy pattern. Now, all of you guys with some math background, I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, sine wave, we get it. <laughs> it's like, okay, just hang with me. We're, we're going to get back to racing. But, um, you know, sometimes we need to talk about these uh, wavy lines as a signal. Now, I use the word signal, um, and I'm going to use that word a lot. Don't get thrown. Just know that when you hear the word signal, it means some wavy line. All right, now let's say that we you know, actually have this signal occurring on our race car and we wanna recreate it on our computer screen. Now remember, the data didn't record every single infinitesimal point along the river. It recorded certain points. And those points could be here Maybe the next point happened to be here, and the next point happened to be here, and the next point happened to be here. In essence, what happened was I was sampling at the same frequency as what was occurring on the car. If by chance I did happen to match that frequency, the thing that computers do is they tend to just connect the dots and draw a line on our computer screen. So what happens is I have a flat line on my computer screen, but out on the car, I actually had that wavy signal. Right? So just remember that if I happen to match that frequency, it will create a flat line. All right now let's say I had something a little slower than the frequency or a little faster than the frequency on the car. And I caught that point, this point, you know, likewise, I caught all these little black dots here. When the computer goes to connect the dots, what shows up on your screen is the red line, not the actual blue signal that occurred on our race car, right? This is known as aliasing. So to quickly recap, if I matched the frequency with my sampling rate, the computer is going to draw a flat line on the screen. If I had a sampling rate, something a little slower or a little faster, and I caught these points, well, then I'm going to get a line on the computer screen that doesn't match the actual occurrence, and we get aliasing. So to avoid this, there's a thing called Nyquist theorem that basically says, you know, kind of paraphrases so it doesn't sound like super engineer here, <laughs> that the sampling rate should be equal to or greater than two times the frequency. We need to do that in order to try and 
recreate that original signal on our computer screen. So you can see that if I have twice, so one frequency would be from here back to the top. So if I have twice the frequency, I'm getting closer to recreating that original signal, but it may not be exact. That's why they always threw in that little greater than two times. Now, some people will say, well, if I just, you know, maybe if I do uh, four times, so if I get four spots, well, then you kind of start hitting these in-between points and the lines don't get a lot more shape to them. Now, granted, you could have a phase shift. You know, there's always going to be an engineer here that says, well, what if it's, you know, phase shift? Well, okay, granted, we could have that, but it's still not going to make a real good recreation. So personally, I like to use like about eight points per cycle. That way, when things go around, I get a, a little truer wave form is what they, they like to call it. Okay, so uh, enough of that engineering stuff, enough of that science thing. Let's really get to what we're here for. We want to talk about sample rates and let's build ourselves uh, a little table with some sample rates. All right, now let's say uh, I have a vibration in my car and I want to figure out where it's coming from. And I also just happen to have some suspension sensors on my car. Yeehaw. Lucky me. <laughs> right, now recall, um, my wheel is going around, but we need to remember that things are happening at some rate. There's some, something happening here speed-wise. So if I think about my car traveling to the right, let's say at 100 miles per hour, and Remember that old Nyquist thing, if for a revolution or one cycle, I would need to have two sampling points. So I need to catch you know, top dead center and bottom dead center. Um, I could kind of recreate that pattern, but it's gonna be the more sawtooth saw type pattern. So you know, I personally like to do eight samples per revolution of the wheel. That way I can recreate that wavy line a lot better. Another thing that does is it's going to help me a little later um, pick up some things because if I only sample at one point and I have to wait for another point to come down to the ground, you know, there may have been something in between that I needed to see. <laughs> but for right now, I'm just trying to find that, uh, that vibration. So at 100 miles per hour, if I grind out the math for a typical sized wheel on a, on a car, it works out to 200 hertz. But remember, if I'm going even faster, I'm going to need to change that sampling rate. All right, um, sorry, this is where it's gonna be just a little sluggish there on the drawings. Hopefully that cleared up for everybody. It, 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 it does look good. This is an area that when, when John and I were chatting about this, that it, um, uh, we all think of things as just the time, right? That just that, uh, the, the, you know, wanting something to happen, you know, every 10th of a second, a signal or whatever. But John has introduced that, boy, the faster you're going, and I think he's gonna explain it even a little bit deeper, but the, the faster you're going, even the more often that you want to do it. So there, there is a distance component as well as a time component. Pretty, pretty interesting way of thinking about it. And I think there's a lot of validity to it. Yep, exactly. Um, so on my chart here, I'm gonna do, 200 hertz is kind of my uh, minimum, is what I like to think it, uh, as my minimum logging rate on suspensions. However, in just a few minutes, we're going to see that it uh, might need to be a lot faster yet. All right, now let's move down here to uh, some driver controls. Uh, I've got brake and throttle listed here. Now, don't get caught thinking, how fast can I push the pedal? and uh, think that, uh, hey, five hertz is fast enough, you know, five times a second, how fast can I push the travel, you know, the, the pedal? Instead, think of how much ground will the car travel at a given speed and that sample rate. For example, if I was going 100 miles an hour and I'm recording my brake pressure at five hertz, in other words, 
every two tenths, I mean, yeah, every 0.2 seconds. I cover 29.3 feet between my data points. That's several car lengths. Now, granted, uh, going to 100 hertz would cut it down to 14.7 feet on the track. But if I'm doing driver coaching and I'm trying to measure where on the track you know, my driver actually applied the brakes entering a corner, or maybe where was he back wide open the throttle exiting the corner, I need better resolution than 14.7 feet. So um, I like 50 hertz on slower tracks, uh, you know, if I'm doing autocross or something, but if I'm working with a professional driver, um, you know, on a faster track, I need at least 100 hertz. Now, this, of course, is where, you know, there's always uh, some electrical engineer or some really sharp guy that comes in and says, hey, but wait, if you're measuring on the track, um, you know, what signal are you using? If we calculate distance off a of GPS, it's only 10 hertz. Um, true, you know, we are talking kind of professional things. And Roger can tell us more here in just a second. Um, I guess there is uh, some new GPS that's uh, becoming available. Um, isn't that uh, going to be 25 hertz now, Roger? Yeah, going to uh, bump up uh, 10 to 25 with a new sensor that's on its way. So that'll be interesting. We'll show you some examples of that here towards the end of the presentation. OK, well, that's that's going to be great. But just remember that you know, 5 hertz might be good when you think about pushing the pedal. But how much distance you travel on the track, that's not going to be fast enough. So um, you know, for me, I like to uh, crank it up a little bit. So oftentimes, you know, 50, if I'm doing something slow, like an, uh, an autocross, but most all the rest of the time, I like, like to keep my brake pressure and my throttle uh, position up to 100 hertz. All right, now a little side note here. Um, if I've got dedicated channels and dedicated sensors to measuring these things, you know, I, I've got more control here. But if I'm getting this out of the ECU, um, I might not be able to change that. That might be a, a given out of the ECU. But just be aware, you know, that there's a, a you know distance travel here, a time component, and take that into account. All right, now let's move down to uh, water temp and oil temp, and you know, thinking how fast can those things change? And you know, if I wanted to recreate that waveform on my computer screen. Now, we could get into that, you know, there's a lot of science involved, you know, we, at that point, we're getting into, you know, the BTU content and the pound of fuel and your engines brake specific fuel consumption per horsepower and the coolant flow rate, you know, and how much is being rejected out of the radiators. Um, but let's just say that it's unlikely that it's ever going to change faster than about five to eight degrees per second in a catastrophic event. You know, I'm wide open throttle with a V8 and uh, my water pump seizes up or the belt comes off or something. Um, but, you know, more likely normal circumstances, I hardly ever see it change more than one or two degrees F per second, you know, say like a Formula Continental or, a, you know, Formula E, Formula F, you know, cars with the uh, radiators in the side pods that don't have fans and I come into the pits and it stops and it you know, starts to climb. But, you know, typically one or two per second. But if I'm really, uh, you know, worried about that, I need to be thinking about the, um, you know, the resolution of my sensor because that can come into play. So, you know, if I'm only concerned with, you know, basic engine health, then one hertz is probably going to get me covered. Uh, but just to be safe, I keep keep mine usually set at five hertz, which probably cover most average users. But if you're that engine guy, you know that guy, <laughs> or the radiator guy, or the engineer focused on something you're know, really trying to recreate a waveform, then you may want to bump it to 20 hertz. So there you go. Um, so I'm going to put 20, you know, five to 20 on my uh, water temp and my oil temp. All right, RPM. This is an interesting channel, uh, especially depending on what you're looking for. Now, of course, because engines have a rotating component, remember the old Nyquist, then you better have your sampling rate cranked up to at least 200 hertz if you're examining your engine at 
6,000 RPM. So just you know, keep in mind, you know, the speed of the engine is now going to drive your sampling rate if you're thinking about you know per rotation and recapturing that signal. But what if I'm concerned with uh, a you know a very fast event? Um, you know, maybe how fast can you shift? Or maybe I've got a P1 or P2 car and I've got a flat shift in that thing, so I can just bang it as fast as I can, and it will shift the gears on me. You know, it's possible for things to happen in less than a tenth of a second. So what we end up with is a you know a very jaggedy line in reality. But if I'm recording at five hertz, or let's say even one hertz, so I took one sample and then one second later I caught another sample, I'm never going to see the event. And even at 10 hertz, so I'm going along every tenth of a second. Granted, you know, I did capture the edges of the event, but on my computer, I'm going to get the green line, not the actual blue line. Now, it could have been offset a little bit. And maybe I caught, you know, just the peak, you know, the pink, uh, I'm sorry, a peak of it going up and down here lower, but I'm still going to have you know, this green line. So I better be sampling at least at 20 hertz to even kind of have a hope of recreating what was going on in, in between. Personally, I like to keep mine cranked up to 50 hertz, um, you know, as, as a minimum. And um, oftentimes, you know, depending on what's happening, you might want to have it up to 200 hertz. If you're just looking at you know the RPMs at the end of a straightaway or something like that, 20 will take care of you. But uh, you know if you're thinking about injector pulse widths, some kind of a harmonic vibration, then you better keep it cranked up to um, 200 hertz. This is one of those areas where it's uh, we're starting to see it a lot here in in your list of of things that, that you look at is there is a big difference in what what uh, you might want or somebody else might want and and sampling rates are while we tend to give those the a default value and 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 we share those numbers with people really depends on what you are trying to get out of the data so I I, I really love that we're having this discussion a lot of people the RPM one would have been jacked way up but but it's kind of interesting that depending on what you're doing you know to 20 hertz might even be okay so I I, I find this to be pretty uh, interesting I hope everybody else is as well. Well, especially if you're um, if you've got a go kart and you've got a Briggs on it, and it's not revving very high, uh, 20 hertz might cover you if you're just you know worried about the RPM at the end of a straightaway or something. Yeah, and it's a but, circle track, yeah. and the and the change is really not all that high anyway, right? right so it's right. Uh, the, the not big difference on the RPM. Kind of interesting. Yeah. So the whole thing I'm trying to you know convey is. Um, I don't know that there's a magic bullet. There is no magic number. Um, you know, think about how fast things happen and select your sampling rate accordingly. All right, here's where it gets really interesting. Um, lots of things can be happening, happening <laughs> at the same time. This will result in a complex signal on our race car, um, kind of like this jaggedy one over here on the right. And if you have suspension sensors, you've no doubt probably seen something that looks like this. And you're thinking, oh boy, that's a, that's a, that's a really crazy squiggly line. <laughs> well, really what's happening is several things are going on at once. Um, I might have some, you know, heave or bounce, maybe a little rocking, a little pitching. Those are, you know, low frequency motions. That might be creating, you know, this pattern right here. So then we kind of see the, you know, the two big ends of it kind of reflect through. Then we might also end up with uh, a medium frequency from the uh, racing surface itself. And one of the examples I always like to use is, uh, you know, take a 10 foot straight edge and go out on your racetrack and try and find the best smoothest piece you can find and when you put that 10 foot straight edge out there I guarantee you're going to find at least one place where you've got a three quarter of an inch deviation off of that straight edge. 
Well, now, if we go back to thinking about how fast things happen at speed, I like to use 60 miles an hour because that's something I can do in my head. <laughs> at 60 miles an hour, I'm going to cover 8.8 .8 of those 10 foot straight edges every second. That means my surface has got, you know, 8.8 .8 of these three quarter inch things happening every second. So that might give me kind of a, a medium to high frequency. All right, throw in, uh, maybe I've got a, a wheel that's out of balance. Maybe I've got a, a dirt track car and it, I don't have the, the plugs in the wheels and I've got a big chunk of mud hit one of my rims, or maybe I lost a wheel weight, or maybe I've got a, a situation where I've got a little bit of eccentricity in my rim and tires usually are made you know they're made by hand so typically there's a little eccentricity in those and you can end up you know with something that's really kind of out of round um, and then you end up with a higher frequency but the thing is all of these combine together to make this crazy squiggly line on your screen so remember if i've got the sampling rates too low i may not end up with you know a good recreation of the waveform on the car. Now I can go crazy and crank it up too high. Um, so it just kind of depends on what I'm trying to uh, to capture here. What is that balance between, uh, you know, what is the downside of, of, of capturing way too much? You are the perfect straight man. That is a great segue for where we're going. <laughs> Thank you and honest guys, I didn't set him up to do this. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's say we have one of these crazy squiggly lines, um, and uh, I'm going to keep my suspensions at um, you know at least 200 if I'm doing something on autocross, and maybe I'm doing something on a maybe a short track oval. Speeds might get to 100, so I keep uh, 100 miles an hour. So I'm going to keep my frequency at 50 hertz. But if I'm doing uh, pro work at the speedway, I'm going to have it up to a thousand hertz because we're going over 200 miles an hour. So just kind of a, a thing there. All right, so let's, let's drop down now and let's talk about uh, lateral and longitudinal G. Um, you notice that I've got 20 to 50 hertz on my chart here. Now, if you think in terms of acceleration equals force divided by mass, you know, and I think about the typical mass of my race car and the typical range of forces, then the change in lateral and longitudinal G is likely going to be fairly modest. Unless maybe you hit somebody or you hit something like a hole or a curb or the wall, you know, in which case that's going to be a pretty fast event. <laughs> so you, while you might be inclined to crank up your sampling rate real high, um, just be aware that you know, you're going to start seeing those, um, you know, high frequency things up here. They're going to be added into your waveform, your squiggly line, and it might get a little confusing. Um, so I like to keep mine between 20 and, and 50. Um, now, steering is kind of in that uh, same boat with throttle and brake. Um, one quick sidebar, if you happen to have your system set up, uh, so you're using a string pot to measure your, uh, your steering, in other words, you got the little string pot and you run the cable over and wrap it around the, the, the steering shaft, try and keep that exposed uh, distance kind of short because that will uh, vibrate uh, you know, I've seen some cars where there's been a lot of airflow making it vibrate or just the track itself, you know, it'll pick up some harmonic somewhere and you'll get a, a way too crazy signal. So try and keep that short. I wish um, I would have uh, been able to t chat with you, John, before I put uh, string pots on and left the string real long because it was easy to mount on a production based car and uh, and ended up with this very noisy signal. And uh, and it took us a, a couple of shots to figure out exactly what was going on. So I, I everybody take a, take take that little hint uh, uh, as good, good advice. Yeah, I even uh, went to work with a fellow one time and he had string pots on all four corners of the suspension. 
and it was an open wheel car. And it's like, uh, I'm not even going to bother looking at the data. This is, let's figure out some other way of doing that. The, the faster you went, the, lo the lower the car got, right? The strings yeah, all bowed back. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, here we go. It all kind of depends on the, the speed. Um, you know, if I'm doing something, you know, a, a quarter midget or something and not a lot is happening, maybe a little autocross or something, 20 hertz on the steering might get it. But otherwise, you know, I'm going to keep my steering uh, set the same as my brake and throttle because, again, I'm trying to relate it to, you know, the distance traveled on the track. Um, you know, the, the whole main takeaway from all of this is don't just take some number blindly. You know, it all is going to depend on how fast something is happening on your car and try and set your your points accordingly. So that kind of covers uh, you know, my main uh, soapbox there. You know, think about what's happening, set your rates accordingly. This is where where that uh, in my mind always it has been how fast did something change you know and and how quickly do I need to have the sensor set up to to capture that change and John's point of certainly continuing to do that but also think about how far fast the car is moving is was was a difference of thought for me and I and and hopefully for you guys as well it, it, I I just found it to be a, a eye-opening that there it really was a two-dimensional thing we're thinking about here not just that single dimension of time so that was uh, interesting to me okay um there's some other interesting things happening on the horizon here roger if you want to go ahead and cover this I think I will. The, uh, the one thing I'd like to do first is, um, is is do another poll before we chat about the the plot settings and, and some ways that we can see a lot of the stuff that John is just just to give us some ideas about. I'm going to launch a poll here. Um, uh, kind of leads us towards the uh, towards towards the end of the session here. Uh, when, when analyzing your data, what functions do you use the most? This is, um, um, we've been using this, this we've used this poll three or four times in, 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 the, in, the, in the recent past. It, has, uh, it is also always an interesting thing. We'll share this one here in just a second. Uh, I'm gonna let that poll go for a moment and, um, and, and let's talk about these plot settings and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll, we'll show the answers to that. Uh, if you finish it, go ahead and just hit the submit button and then it'll, it'll jump out of your way. The plot settings. Uh, in, in New Ray Studio 3 analysis, you have the option of uh, under the settings button uh, that, that you can come in and you can look at the track map and the time distance plot. And you can choose the thickness of the lines, which we've been able to do in the past with Ray Studio 2. But one of the things you can do is if you set that line width to, uh, to zero, then you have a, the ability to change the dot width, leave it at the default of one or, or, or make it a little bigger if, if that's what works for you. And then you see, if, if John will slide to the next slide, the, what you'll see in the, in the data file is that you get uh, to view the actual dots, the actual data points that were gathered uh, as you are, are looking at it. So what you're seeing here is a, is a couple of sessions. One of the sessions is, is the, the yellow dots, is, the, um, uh, is a new one of the new GPS-09 sensors, which is capturing data at 25 samples per second or 25 hertz. And, the, and you can see the blue dots is, the, uh, is, is, our, is a, a very fantastic G, the GPS-08 sensor, which is get, capturing, uh, capturing that data at uh, 10 hertz or one, one sample per tenth of a second. But what's interesting about it is uh, if you, um, um, maybe, maybe um, you've got the mouse, uh, John, but over there on the left graph, you can see right down the yellow where it goes through the braking and then there's a transition on those, those yellow dots. You can see that bump right there. If you're not capturing enough dots or we turn on the line, you can see where it has connected the dots. We won't do that right now, but you can see sometimes how that straight lines to the next point. And if you've got the, the your frequency or your sampling rate set up uh, too low, you, can, you will be able to see where it uh, has maybe missed, you know, missed an event that has happened. You can actually see the dots that are there. I think this is a, in, in Ray Studio 3 uh, analysis, this is, a, this is really a cool tool for us to be able to look at and understand a lot more about our sampling rates and uh, where we're actually capturing that data and whether or not it's been good or not. So I really, uh, I really do like that. Um, the uh, anything you want to add to that one, John? Before I close out the the poll and show everybody. Uh, 
No, I, I think you you covered it. Perfect. I think this I, I, this is a function that I've wanted for a long time in the in, in the software and uh, and and again, it's just going to be as easy as turning the line width to zero, and you're just going to be left with the dots. So it's a it, it's a it's a pretty cool tool, and you'll be able to see that those dots and line work in both the the normal measures graph and in the GPS map view. So that's a, that's kind of a cool tool. Let's go ahead and end that polling just so everybody can take a look at it, and I'll share that. And you know, let's share the results. Now, what you can see here is the, um, uh, the majors graph is is still it, it's just the, it's kind of the core of data analysis. You know the squiggly lines. Ninety percent of you have uh, have answered that that's uh, one of the one of the functions you use a lot. And uh, the the next one, the next highest one is the channels report. We have talked a lot about channels report in here in the in the in the webinar series, and I am glad to see that that just continues to bump up in in use. I think that is such a powerful tool. Um, uh, the uh, last Tuesday we had the uh, we had the, the the webinar where we talked a lot about that as being part of the vehicle health. You know, quickly bring that up and take a look at low oil pressures and high water temperatures and stuff very quickly. Glad to see that everybody is uh, is using that quite a bit. Time compare bar, uh, a very you know, very much a, a <laughs> part of the measures graph and a and a big piece of. Uh, Boy, the, the the best way to, to to look at your data real quickly, and then I think the the next one is math channels. We've talked a lot about math channels here. That is fifty two percent. Have a, a lot of folks. We've been learning a lot about math channels, and we're going to continue to do that. We've got a couple of uh, upcoming webinars uh, to dig into that even a little bit more. So, and then split report forty six percent. You know, fairly close to that. So, I appreciate everybody uh, everybody chatting about that. Uh, and uh, and take and helping me, you know, continue to learn about what you guys are working with, and then uh, and then continue to build uh, build these webinars around that. So, I do appreciate that. So um, uh, we do um, the uh, I do have one question in the uh, in the in the dialogue uh, in the question and answer. Uh, Tice asks, can you mount a GPS 09 to a current data logger like an MXG? In the future, yes. The the first piece of that, the first one of those is coming out is 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 built into the new the the new Micron 5S pro product. Uh, but very soon, you're going to see that there'll be a, a a GPS 09 standalone sensor that'll be that'll be coming out. Uh, so that is uh, that is coming soon. Just has to get through the pipeline and and, and out to all of you guys. So that'll come. It's coming soon. Okay, John, if you would slide to the next slide, I think that it's uh, it's kind of our our, uh, our our ending point. I don't have any questions up there for me right now, so um, let's kind of go towards the end. And if you have a question, we'll at, uh, throw that into the question and answer box. We'll we'll, we'll start the the process of uh, of of uh, closing this down here, and then uh, if there's another question, we'll we'll answer it. We'll turn it over to to John a little bit before we end. This video, just like every other one that we've been doing with these, uh, gets recorded and it gets stuck out onto the uh, the AIM Sports YouTube site. The um, uh, if, if you're, you most of you are familiar with it, but uh, this this is going to be number uh, video number 126 that we're adding up there. So it has been a uh, it has been a great tool for us and uh, just tons of great feedback that everybody is uh, everybody is enjoying it a lot. So the um, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, John. I think the next one is the is customer support. It, 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 we we show this one every time, but it's uh it, it's important to us because we you know we really are a customer support company that happens to sell racing electronics. That's kind of the way that uh, the, our focus is that strong on customer support. So, the uh, uh, the guys are out there. I know the 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 compressed motorsport season has been uh, is finally it, it is starting to uh, close down a little bit as the weather is turning in in many parts of the country here. So, uh, but if uh, if you see us out at the track, make sure you come up and say hello. We'd love to chat with you. Answer any questions you might have there look for us so we're out there we're out there as often as we can be and if you don't see us at the track give us a call at the 800 number we'll uh, we're more than happy to 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 chat with you on the phone and, and help you solve anything and of course uh contacting me we we do tons of these zoom one-on-one -on -one zoom calls and answer lots of questions and and of course uh, have all the videos as well so give us a holler anytime you need something so go ahead and go to the next slide john we'll talk about what the next webinar is going to be and it's uh, tied a little bit to the to the uh uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I should have a, I should know what the next slide is, right? One of the cool things, and we're talking about um, uh, customer support and, and knowledge and, and information. One of the things, and um, one of the things that John does, and it's the way I was actually introduced to John, is the um, uh, 
he does some uh, some webinars out on the uh, on the web that he that he does and he does cycles of them right so you, you do some and then he takes a, a week or two off it's not like this is easy right all the time but but uh john offers these and uh i have never had the time to go and sit down and 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 do them they're the aim ones are often on mondays and uh, those are travel days for me typically so i've uh, never been able to sign up i i will uh, i have in the wanted to in the past and i will continue if i'm uh, if i'm going to be around to do these kind of things but uh, the next one, the next series starts on November 2nd. You know, there, oops, if you jump back once for me there, uh, John, John's trying to push me on. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you said next, I was yeah, going. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 yeah, the next webinar. He, he is a quick trigger finger there. The uh, These webinars are really good. I, I have given hundreds of uh, on-site seminars. And when I when we're ch chatting about uh, support and training that out there, uh, many, many people have told me that they've attended John's John's webinars. And I have yet to find a single person that ever said that, uh, that, that they didn't uh, enjoy them immensely and learn a ton. So uh, I feel very, very comfortable in, uh, in saying that uh, Gosh, if you if you if you uh, if you have some time, you want to learn a little bit more. There is a there is the what he calls the original data acquisition webinars, and then he does have an advanced series as well. So uh, and and the price is very very reasonable, and uh, you get a ton for it. All the handouts and the links and the recordings, and one on one with John. Uh, you know, so it. Um, gosh, I certainly consider it. It's 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 worth your time. So there's a website there. Robbie uh, maybe has already linked it. If not, uh, he'll link it soon The where you can get directly to the webinar uh, home website if you want to click on it and find out a little bit more. So uh, I appreciate that. So next is a ne next next now, right? <laughs> so the, um, the the next webinar that we're uh, that we're going to be giving is, uh, is is this coming Tuesday. This is kind of an interesting one. And I see, do see a couple of questions there. and We'll get to those. Um, we had a, a le the learning styles. James Colburn uh, talked about different learning styles the other day in one of our webinars. And uh, one of the tools that he talked about and, and showed uh, uh, in his was was this was a lap replay tool. It was something that we haven't talked a ton about here at the at, in, in the webinar series. And I and uh, at the time I I promised that uh, when we had a, a a spot we would actually uh, spend a little bit of time talk about it, show how to get the best use out of it, how to set it up, how to understand it well, and uh, and we're going to do that next Tuesday on October twenty seventh. I'm going to go ahead and host it. We might bring in somebody. Maybe we'll talk James into into coming and join us. Maybe uh, maybe somebody else. We'll see. But we're going to talk about lap replay function in the in the Ray Studio analysis, the uh, Ray Studio two analysis. We've been um, we've we've done a lot of functionality things like this in the past, and we've kind of gone on. We've talked about books. We've talked about sampling rates today. Some other things. So let's jump back and let's talk about a, a specific function again. And so we'll do that on Tuesday. So we're looking forward to that. Um, one question, if you go to the last last slide, John, I would appreciate it. One question that uh, Galaxy S8 has, John, will you do a webinar se session over December? We've got the one, you've got the one series coming up here in uh, in November. Uh, are you gonna do anything through the December, uh, you know, towards the end of the year or be early, early next year? Uh, haven't thought about it quite yet. <laughs> 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 this year, it's so crazy. Um, welcome to 2020, right? Yeah, welcome to 2020. If if we do, it will be late. You know, the holidays kind of make things goofy in there. Um, but yes, if it's not in December, it will be January. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Either way, that uh, we have the ones that are starting, uh, you know, fairly soon, and in the next what week and a half or so, and uh, uh, join in on those, and then he'll he'll do something, uh, you know, down the road as he always has. He continues to do these, so I do appreciate that. Let's let's go ahead and, and close this one down, John. Do you have anything else you'd like to add before uh, about data sampling rates and uh, as we kind of call this one to an end? Uh, no, just you know, want to reiterate. You know, don't just blindly take a number somewhere. Um, you know, a lot of numbers get thrown around the pits. It's like, yeah, yeah, do this. It's like, think about what you're doing. And remember the whole idea is that we want to capture what happened on the car and recreate that wavy line, whatever that squiggly line is on our computer screen. And in a way that uh, it gives you it, it with enough clarity or enough, uh, you know, um, you know 
fineness that, that you can see it where you want on that track. That was the that was the one thing that was kind of cool that you added that uh, boy the speed of the of the vehicle that you expect to be traveling is is an important part. Boy, if you're doing 200 miles an hour, it doesn't help any if you want to see exactly where it happened to do it every tenth of a second, right? You're, you're covering a lot of ground. So that was a that was another piece of this that I think was was very valuable. So thank you for that. Perfect. I appreciate it. There's some contact information for uh, for John and myself. If there's anything that you want to chat about, the uh, uh, Matt says he runs into that 200 mile an hour problem all the time in his 914. The uh, <laughs> uh, inside joke for those of us that, the, that, that have been attending a lot of webinars, um, and Matt shows a lot of his data. His his 914 won't uh, do 200 miles an hour off the back of an airplane. I think is what he's trying to say. The uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we have we have fun. The uh, John, I, I, I appreciate it. This is your second one. I know it's a lot of work to, to put these in, and I know you're a busy guy with uh, with everything you're doing. Even though you're retired, the uh, that uh, that retired thing just means you're you're doing more uh, around the house, right? And and in the shop, and the machine shop, and and uh, and the rest of what you do. So I uh, thank you very much for doing this. It's a, it's a, it's a big pleasure for us to have you here. Yeah, I think retired just means I don't get paid as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something to that too, right? Well, thanks everybody for coming. I do appreciate it. Uh, look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday for the for the lap replay uh, functionality. And it's going to be a great time. Thanks for coming, everybody. And we'll see you at the next one. See y'all.